Welcome to the latest Zeal Access webinar. My name is James Radke, Managing Editor of Zeal Access, and today I will be offering a summary of how drugs get approved and, equally important, how they become accessible for patients in Canada. Today's webinar is designed to help those advocacy groups understand the convoluted drug approval process in Canada so they can decide how, where, or why they may want to become more vocal in advocating for some parts of that process. On to the subject, the approval process in Canada. Drugs are authorized for sale in Canada once they have successfully gone through the drug review process with Health Canada, more specifically with the Health Products and Food Branch of Health Canada. That branch, known as the HPFB, goes through a thorough review of the submitted information, usually involving pivotal clinical trials that evaluate the safety and efficacy of the drug, as well as preclinical trials, uh, mechanism of action studies, cell culture studies, manufacturing information. There's a whole plethora of information in those reports. And they also look at what the company plans to put in their PI and their brochures that are being read by the doctors and the patients. If Health Canada decides the benefits outweigh the risks, the drug is issued a notice of compliance as well as a drug information number which permits the drug company to market that drug in Canada and indicates that the drug is officially approved for sale in Canada. In most cases, before going on to how a patient gets access to the drugs, there are two exceptions to the Health Canada approval process. One is the priority review. HPFB's priority review process allows for fast review of promising drugs for life-threatening or severely debilitating conditions. The special access program allows physicians to gain access to drugs that are not currently available in Canada. They cross the border. Following approval by the special access program, a doctor can prescribe those drugs to specific patients if the physician can provide compelling evidence that conventional therapies have failed or are inappropriate. Step two, gaining access. Um, there are basically two ways for patients in Canada to get a drug. It's either through the private plan or through the public insurance plan. If it's private, it is fairly straightforward. Generally speaking, a few months after Health Canada approves the drug, it will be on most private insurance plans and the patient can get the medicine. The same cannot be said for the public plan. There's a lot more steps involved. Here's a slide from the Canadian government. Most Canadians, as you can see, use the public plan, but these numbers vary a bit depending on who you ask. But generally around 30 to 50% of Canadians have some sort of public insurance. And as you can see up here, once Health Canada approves the drug and it goes to the private drug plan, it's one step. But if it's through the public plan, there are numerous steps involved. Uh, these are sort of the main players, but there are more. Um, they can be grouped sort of in two categories, HTAs or Health Technology Assessment Agencies, and that is CADF and Quebec's INSSS. And the other ones are the what we call the price negotiators, and that would be PMPRB and PCPA, which works for the provincial and territory ministries. And we'll go over these in a little more detail now. Uh, CADF stands for the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies in Health, and it is an HTA. An HTA assesses the drug's value, and that value is complicated. How do you measure if a drug reduces hospitalizations or how it increases a person's productivity? or at how it changes other drugs or services needed. As you can imagine, it's a really, really complicated calculation. If a cystic fibrosis drug means a person can now work 40 hours a week instead of 24, what value does that provide? Or if that drug means the person can now has to go to the hospital to get infused, what is the cost of that? And also the drug may have a lot of side effects that reduce the person's quality of life. How do you put a value on that as well? The number of factors that can impact the cost of care as well as the person's quality of life are too numerous to fathom. Fortunately, there's some very smart people working at CADF to help figure that stuff out. And one thing they all do is try to find a 
gold standard so that you, they can compare different treatment modalities to one another, as well as different diseases. And that gold standard, the quality adjusted life year. Now, a quality adjusted life year is what it sounds like. If you are disabled, your quality of life is reduced. And as you age, as shown in this cartoon, your quality of life is reduced as well. So if you are in perfect health, you have a quality of one. And if you're dead, you have a quality of zero. Now, with regard to treatments, if a person lives 10 years with a new drug, but the side effects and the added burden of the disease slowly progressing means their quality of life is reducing, the HTA may rate those 10 years as 0.7 or 0.5. Obviously, it's more complicated than that. And as this figure shows, generally as a person ages or the disease progresses, the qualities will reduce. Now, the controversial part, CADF and most HTAs generally assign a dollar value to a quality. And if a drug is priced above a 50 or 60,000 per quality threshold, CADF will likely tell the company to lower their price. CADF will also be more thorough or picky in which patient populations get the drug. So if Health Canada approves a drug for spinal muscular atrophy, CADF can come along and say the drug is only applicable to those specific SMA patients that were in the original clinical trial. Generally speaking, CADF is trying to save the taxpayers money, but their tactics can be very frustrating, especially to patients who on a public plan who see patients on a private plan getting a drug or patients south of the border also getting that drug. I'm as critical as CADF as anyone, but they do have a very, very King Solomon-esque task ahead of them when trying to decide which patients get which drugs. PMPRB, or the Patent and Medicines Price Review Board, is a quasi-judicial board established uh, about 30 years ago. And they are, they are Canada's price negotiator. And what this agency does, it compares Canada's price to prices in seven other similar countries. As you can see here, France, Italy, Germany, Sweden, Switzerland, the UK tend to have lower prices overall than Canada. The only one that's consistently higher is the United States. Now, 30 years ago, PMPRB was a welcome agency. It reduced drug prices dramatically. 30 years ago, Canada was similar to the US in prices, but that is no longer the case but there's still room for improvement. Hence, a reform is currently underway. Moving forward, PMPRB plans to expand it 12 countries. Now, one obvious problem with that scenario is that means that a drug, in order for PMPR to negotiate, that drug has to be approved in 12 other countries before they can properly negotiate a price. Moving on to the provinces, Quebec has their own version of CADF to decide on the value of the drug but the provinces tend to negotiate the price of the drug in a similar manner to PMPRB, and it's called the PCPA, or the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance. And they negotiate drugs similar to PMPRB. But at the end of the day, it is the ministries of the various provinces and territories that decide which drugs will be on the formulary. And as you can imagine, it could be a long and arduous process to get a new drug to the patient. But that may all change soon, which brings us to the next slide. There is a national pharmacare plan being proposed that would replace the 13 plus public plans currently in place that could dramatically change the landscape. So what is this national care plan? In the 2018 budget, the government established an advisory council on the implication of a national pharmacare led by Dr. Eric Hoskins, and it is to provide independent advice on how to best implement a possible national pharmacare in a manner that is affordable for Canadians, their families, employers, and governments. The Council will conduct a fiscal, economic, and social assessment of various domestic and international models related to pharmacare and is also going around the country right now asking various stakeholders six simple questions. Well, not so simple. The first question, who should be covered under national pharmacare? All Canadians or just Canadians with very expensive drugs or something else? The second question, 
how should this pharmacare be delivered? Should it be through a public insurance, through a mixture of public and private, or again, something else? The third question, which drugs should be covered? Only essential drugs, all drugs, or something else? Fourth, should there be any variability? Should it be the same plan throughout the country or should it be based on geography or who you're working for or something else? And the last two questions, should patients pay for a portion of the drugs and should employers, should they get involved? Now that is just a brief overview of how drugs get from being approved by Health Canada to being in the hands of the patients. Before closing, I want to take a minute to give you a brief background on Zeal Access. We are a company focused on helping patient advocacy groups with their communications and understanding how the system works. And that includes the drug approval process. Our staff has over 15 years experience in web design, advocacy, and medical communications. And we want to use those skills to help advocacy groups reach their potential. If you have any questions, feel free free to reach out to me at jim at zealaccess.ca. Thank you for taking the time to watch this webinar and feel free to go to zealaccess.ca for more tips. Have a good day.